It's so good to be here with you guys this morning, to be worshiping Jesus with you. I am so grateful that in the midst of this pandemic, we are able to gather together over technology, whether it's by phone or whether it's by Facebook Live. It's good to be here to be worshiping with you. Look forward to hearing what stands out most to you from this sermon. If you are joining us through Facebook Live, please feel free to, in the comments section, write out different things that really stood out to you and were encouraging to you or challenging to you. Let us know how your life is going to be changed and how a difference is going to occur in your life as a result of joining together to study the Word of God. Let's pray before we start our service off. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you are a God who loves us, a God who loves us so much that you sent your only son, Jesus, that he would die on the cross in our place and that he would rise from the grave so that if our faith is in him, we would know without a shadow of a doubt that you have chosen us to be your children. Lord, I pray that you would be working in our hearts and our minds that we would be interacting with you, that your Holy Spirit would flood us this morning, that we would be overwhelmed by your love and your grace, that we would be the kind of people who do not live in fear of disease, people who do not live in fear of economic collapse, but instead that we would be a people who trust you for every aspect of our lives. Jesus, there are a lot of hurting people out there. There are a lot of people who are afraid and they need your comfort. So we ask this morning that you would be sending your spirit that your spirit would be drawing the world close to you so that they can experience the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace. Lord, I pray during this time that we would experience your Sabbath rest and that we would be Your body that honors you, brings glory to you, and brings good to those around us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Again, it's so wonderful to be with you, to be joining and studying the Word of God with you. Um, babe, while you're there, I see that someone has made a comment. Would you look to just make sure that the... Um, audio and everything is going good. Um, it just says that um, Janine joined. Oh, okay. Hi, Janine. <laughs> Hello. So glad that you're here. So glad that you're on. Another comment was made, and you can tell because they may have commented based on that. <laughs> you know, it's funny how all of this technology makes a difference for us and how we are living our everyday life. <laughs> and as you see, my wife's red hair crawl along the bottom of the screen. Uh, <laughs> she is a wonderful blessing to me and so helpful in getting all of this stuff figured out because it has been interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, sounds good. All right, sounds good they're saying, so awesome. Let's do the Lord's Prayer, and then we will dive into our study for this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This morning we are continuing in our study of the Gospel of Luke. And this morning in particular, we're entering into the sixth chapter. So please open your Bibles and take out some note paper as we study together. Last week, as we were concluding Luke chapter 5, we saw that moralism and religious behavior cannot do anything for us. In fact, we saw that moralism and human religious tradition are incompatible with faith in Jesus. And that these traditions end up making a mess in our lives as we try to care for and connect with others in the name of Jesus. We see a portion of this fleshed out in our passage for today. When the Pharisees try to make it look like Jesus and his disciples were sinning. Now we know that Jesus never sinned and that he is the perfect sacrifice, the one, only one who lived a perfect life. And that he endured the righteous wrath of God in our place. So when we think about Sabbath rest, as New Testament believers who have been called to something greater than man-made religion that is just trying to figure out a way to make God happy in our own power, what can we learn from Jesus about Sabbath, about rest, and about worshiping God in his power? As we think about these questions, as we go through our study, we are going to be asking ourselves questions like, when do I rest? How often should I rest? What is the difference between relaxation and refreshment? How did Jesus rest? How do we define work? And what is the purpose of regular rest? We will address each of these questions in varying degrees. However, it's not my purpose in preaching this sermon to answer those questions for you, but instead to help you build a Bible-based, Jesus-focused worldview that prepares you to wrestle with these questions in a way that honors Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, and builds up your fellow Christians. I hope your Bibles are still open to Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. For those of you who are joining on Facebook, I did put the translation that I am using in the description section. So on the right there, as you click see more or something along those lines, it will drop down and you will be able to follow along with me. But I hope you have your Bibles out as well. And keep them open throughout the sermon because we will be referencing back to this passage and others, um, other passages throughout the sermon. And you should be checking everything that I say against Scripture. So let's dive into Scripture. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11 say on a sabbath while he was going through the grain fields his disciples 
plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did? When he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there, and Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to them, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. In Luke 6, 1 through 11, our passage for this morning, we see two different interactions with Jesus and the religious leaders on a Sabbath day. In Luke 6, 1 through 5, we see that some of Jesus' disciples were picking grain from a field. Now, according to Scripture, picking grain from someone else's field was permitted in Scripture, but not in the tradition of the religious leaders. So these religious leaders were holding Jesus as a teacher responsible for his students by their own standards rather than by God's standards. As Jesus addressed their concerns by mentioning a hero of their faith, King David, David broke the law of God. And the religious leaders at that time were known for excusing what David had done because it was David. However, they were holding Jesus and his disciples to an extra biblical rule, a rule that was added on top of Scripture that wasn't found in Scripture, but instead the religious leaders said, you know what, Scripture isn't enough, so we're going to add on to it to protect people from breaking the Sabbath. So the religious leaders were willing to excuse their own religious idol, King David, of breaking the actual law of God while they were trying to impose extra laws on God himself, the Lord of the Sabbath. The second interaction we see is Jesus was interacting with the religious leaders regarding the Sabbath in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. One thing I want you to recognize in this is it was a setup. There was a man there with a crippled hand, and the religious leaders that knew that Jesus was often known to heal 
and he didn't practice the Sabbath the way that they wanted, and they were losing power among, and influence among the people. And so they sat and they watched. Would Jesus break their traditions? Would he heal on the Sabbath? However, Jesus knew what they were trying to do. He knew what they were thinking, and he asked them a question, a question that was designed to display that healing on the Sabbath honors God rather than dishonors God. The religious leaders couldn't figure out an answer where they would look good and maintain their authority, so they just stayed quiet. They didn't answer, and they waited to see what would happen. So what did Jesus do? Jesus healed him, but not in the way that they expected. A lot of the time when Jesus would heal, he would lay hands on people, and their ailment would rescind, their body would be fixed, and all of a sudden they would experience healing. But this time, Jesus just talked. And Jesus told the man with the crippled hand to stretch it out. And as the man responded in faith, his hand was healed. Now the religious leaders became angry because their trap didn't work. And instead, Jesus gained more influence and more authority as people listened to him, as people liked what he was doing as people felt the freedom that Jesus was bringing as opposed to the oppression that the religious leaders were bringing. The religious leaders were more focused on proving themselves right than they were focused on being right with God. Have you ever wanted to be right more than you've wanted to be like God? I know that I have. In order for us to develop a healthy, accurate, and godly approach to the Sabbath, it will be helpful for us to look at how the Sabbath came about. The Sabbath is rooted in God's created order. God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Now, many Bible-believing, God-honoring Christians disagree about whether these days are literal 24-hour days or not. And when we start talking about the seven days of creation, it can become easy to get stuck, to get sucked into a debate of what Scripture means by days and miss out on some of the more important questions. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we see that God rested during the days of creation, and in doing so, he gave us a pattern of how we should live. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. In the beginning of time, God modeled a Sabbath rest for us. God did not need to rest. He didn't say, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm going to take a nap and see how things go. Instead, God rested as a model for us because he knew that rest is something that we need in order to be our most effective. God knows what's best for us and how we operate. When I first started in ministry, I thought that because I was doing God's work, that that was enough. That that was enough rest. And what I found is after a couple of years of going, 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 and rarely taking a day off, probably not really even taking one day off a month, my body turned against me. I refused to Sabbath, and so God enforced a Sabbath on me. And so we see that Sabbath is actually a way that God cares for us, that God calls us, that God draws us into a healthy place with him. And we see some of God's design for the Sabbath in Mark 2. This is a parallel passage to our study in Luke 6 today, but it's from John Mark's Gospel account. And Mark 2.27 gives us some additional words of Jesus that are not found in Luke's account. Mark 2.27 says, And he, Jesus, said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What we're seeing here as is that Sabbath rest was given to us by God for our best interests. It's not about us conforming to the Sabbath, but us functioning in a way that brings the most glory to God and equips us most effectively as we worship God and as we care for those around us. Sabbath rest is an act of worship. Sabbath rest is a way of intentionally recognizing that God is in control and that he is our provider. We are ultimately not the ones who provide for ourselves. Yes, we work hard. But without the grace of God, we can't even take a breath. Taking a Sabbath rest is worship because we are saying, God, you are worthy of our trust. I trust you to handle the things that I am not able to control. And I will not try to control them during this time of rest. It continues on. It doesn't just start at creation, but 
As we look at the history of God's people, we notice that in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, God gave us the Ten Commandments. And we see that even in the Ten Commandments, rest was incredibly important to God. It made his top ten list as the fourth commandment. So this is what the fourth commandment says in Genesis chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So, how do we as New Testament, New Covenant believers practice the Sabbath? How do we live under grace now that the law has been fulfilled by Jesus' perfection and honor at the same time the creative design that God used when he made us. There are a variety of different approaches, and the New Testament does not clearly lay out a step-by-step -step approach. However, that does not mean that the New Testament is silent in regards to the Christian Sabbath or how we should interact with our fellow Christians who have differing viewpoints and practices regarding the Sabbath. So keep your finger in Luke chapter 6 as you turn to the book of Romans. Specifically turn to Romans chapter 14 verse 15. Romans chapter 14, verse 15. One person esteems one day as better than the other, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. That was Romans chapter 14, verse 15. No? Well, evidently I messed that one up. Sorry. No, you're good. Romans. Well, I will find that as we continue to go on. But, um... that how we use or restrict our own freedom in regards to the Sabbath is a personal decision. And there is not a blanket, one-size-fits-all approach that everyone must follow. Sabbath 
Some Christians hold to the Old Testament Jewish Sabbath from sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. Not 15, Solomon. Chapter 14, verse 5. Ah, it was Romans chapter 14, verse 5, not Romans chapter 14, verse 15. So Romans 14, 5 is this passage. So some practice the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday from Friday night to Saturday night. Others have adapted the Sabbath rest to Sundays, calling it the Lord's Day, honoring the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, and seeing in the book of Acts that people gathered together in the church on the first day of the week. This is probably the most common practice among Christians with a huge variety on how it's practiced. Practice of the Lord's Day ranges from those who listen to a sermon most Sunday mornings and go about their day to those who set Sunday aside for only overtly religious practices including prayer, Bible study, reflection, and worship services. I have several acquaintances who fall into this stricter category of not permitting family games in their homes on Sunday, nor watching sports or TV shows, and only reading things that are specifically designed to grow their faith or Bible knowledge. I've heard of people who refuse to allow anyone over to their homes on Sunday because they believe hosting would distract them from their pursuit of God. Some view taking a Sabbath as being lazy, but that would mean that God was lazy and nothing could be further from the truth. Some view taking, or there are those who, like me, practice Sabbath rest on a different day than is practiced by most, because we believe that all days are alike, yet trust God's pattern for humanity and for all of creation. That rest is essential and important, and what works best is resting every seven days specific practice rest as i mentioned earlier i know people whom i respect that hold more stringent views than i do personally and one of the ways that i love them is by honoring their views not flaunting my freedom on sundays in their faces and recognizing that Romans 14.5 shows us that we are both in the right if our goal is to honor Jesus in all things. While Sunday is able to meet my personal needs for corporate worship, Sunday is not a restful or rejuvenating day for me or my family. In order to best practice godly Sabbath rest, what aspects should we make sure that we are including? We should include trusting God, worshiping God, rejuvenating spiritual growth and family number one taking a break from work is a way of trusting God it is saying God I trust you so much that I am leaving these things in your hands and I'm committed to trusting you even when it feels like I need to take control back to get the right things done. 
It's saying, God, you know better than I do. My preaching professor, Dr. Neely, often said, one of the most spiritual things you can do today is take a nap. Resting in God's provision and protection is an act of faith and worship and trust in God. So how do we pursue worship as a vital aspect of our Sabbath rest? Our purpose in taking Sabbath should include honoring God, our Creator, worshiping Him, becoming more like Him, and both modeling and prioritizing our faith in front of our family so that they can see how important God is to us. Part of my family rest includes Christine and I individually spending time studying God's Word, family prayer, and studying with the boys. Right now, that includes reading a chapter in Proverbs, studying about Jesus in a book called Theology, and reading Bible stories out of one of the boys' kids' Bibles. How do you model worship when you rest? Other than showing up to Sunday service or pulling up a sermon on your screen, how do you live out worship as you Sabbath? Our next component of Sabbath rest is rejuvenation. I am an introvert, and in order for me to recharge, I need time alone, or at least time when I can be free from engaging with people. On Friday, when I took my Sabbath rest, I was wearing earplugs while sitting on the couch with Christine. I had my Bible, a Bible study, and a pencil in my lap. I love being near my family, yet sometimes I need to not have to interact with people as a whole to recharge and connect with Jesus. One of the reasons why I have repeatedly throughout this message referred to this as Sabbath rest rather than just rest is because Sabbath rest is something far greater than just resting or what my wife calls bludging. An Australian slang for just laying around. There's a big difference between what we call rest and being rejuvenated by God and Sabbath rest. God keeps challenging me to seek rejuvenation more than what we call rest. I go through seasons where life feels too busy and out of control. So when I have a break or any downtime, my goal can become checking out. But when I have mentally or emotionally checked out, I am not left refreshed when I check back in. However, when I rejuvenate by listening to worship music, reading scripture, prayer, journaling, having an intellectually stimulating conversation with Christine, or reading a book, I come back better equipped to honor Jesus and love people. So how do you best rejuvenate in Jesus? Spiritual growth is something that I find more difficult to quantify. However, when we actively seek and pursue Jesus, the result is growing closer to Him. The more I love Jesus, the more aware I become of sin and idolatry in my life, 
And the more I hate that sin and idolatry that lives in me. Growing closer to Jesus does not leave me in a place of thinking that I am better than others. And it should not leave you in a place where you think that you are better than others. Growing closer to Jesus helps us realize how far away from God we would be if Jesus had not intervened and saved us. I know that I am a stronger Christian and a more dedicated follower of Jesus than I was two years ago. But I also have a clearer picture of how deeply sin is rooted in my heart and life. What area of your life? Are you actively working to become more like Jesus? Are you looking to Jesus as your benchmark? Or are you evaluating yourself by how much better you are than others? When was the last time that you sat down, that you took time with Jesus and a journal, that you picked up a pen and you prayed and you asked God to reveal hidden sin in your life? Take some time this afternoon in your Sabbath rest to journal. And ask God to show you the areas of your heart that he wants to work on right now, transforming you from the inside out. Something else that we see as family is important when we Sabbath. God created us within the context of community. Specifically, he created us in family units. And these family units are the most basic and fundamental building block of society. In Jewish culture, the Sabbath is about deepening and strengthening those family bonds. In addition, true rejuvenation and worship. How will you love on your family today in the name of Jesus? Godly Sabbath rest for followers of Jesus include trusting God, worshiping God, being rejuvenated, Pursuing spiritual growth and connecting with your family. We rest because it is what is best for us. We rest to honor, worship, and reflect the glory of God to those around us. And we rest because of the gospel. Jesus is the eternal Son of God who created all of creation. We rebelled and broke that foundation. And rather than saying we had to work to re earn our position with God, Jesus left the comforts of heaven. He lived the perfect, sinless life that we had failed to live. He died a horrific death on the cross in our place, taking the righteous wrath of God on himself. And Jesus rose from the grave to give us the right and true expectation that if we, if our faith is in him, we will live forever with him in eternal rest. Sabbath rest is saying, Jesus, 
did it all. He did it all for us. Jesus paid the price. And I can rest in his ability to do what I cannot. Let me leave you with this quote from Tim Keller. The purpose of Sabbath is not simply to rejuvenate yourself in order to do more production, nor is it the pursuit of pleasure. The purpose of Sabbath is to enjoy your God, life in general, what you have accomplished in the world through his help, and the freedom that you have in the gospel, the freedom from slavery to any material object or human expectation. The Sabbath is a sign of the hope that we have in the world to come. It is my prayer for each and every one of you that you would Sabbath in Jesus, that you would truly rest and be rejuvenated and grow in Jesus, that you would be intentional about honoring, worshiping, and trusting God. By taking a regular Sabbath rest. There is an article that just two minutes ago should have popped up on our Facebook page by Tim Keller about what Sabbath rest is, and I encourage each of you to read that. Also, further down on the church's page, there are a list of five different songs with a different variety of music style. If you're looking for musical worship this morning, you're welcome. I am not going to burst your eardrums by trying to lead you. <laughs> but it is something that is very important, and so it's my hope and my wish for you that you would engage with Jesus by making a joyful noise, by singing out, and by worshiping him with everything that you have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you love us, that you sent Jesus so that when this life is done, we may enter into your eternal presence and rest. Lord, as we practice Sabbath rest here on earth, we ask that we would reflect the Prince of Peace, that we would enjoy you with everything that we have, that we would lead those around us to rest in you as well. In Jesus' name.